Hi everybody, I'm the Village Camera Nerd and we're gonna be talking about how the old is new again. Now when people ask for my recommendation of what camera they should buy, a lot of times they're thinking about what the newest and latest greatest gadget in Gizmo is. But usually the latest and greatest is not that cheap. For blogging cameras, for example, the latest and greatest is this thing that hasn't even been released yet, the ZV-1 from Sony. It's $748. And that doesn't include any accessories that you might want to get with the camera. But for those of you that want to save money, you don't have to look at the latest and greatest. There are really solid cameras from yesteryear that you start out with and be absolutely happy with. On Memorial Day weekend, this thing caught my eye. A freaking $447 for a Lumix G7 that used to be $800 MSRP, but now it comes with accessories. For example, on Adorama, look at this crazy thing. For just a little bit more money, you get a freaking vlogging studio. But what is the Lumix G7? The Lumix G7 is essentially a 4K shooting mirrorless micro four thirds camera. And this kit includes a 14 to 42 millimeter lens. And it is a pretty legit camera. Actually, a lot of uh, photographers that like using micro four thirds actually love this thing. But what about a blogger? Well, a blogger loves it because of the flip out screen. I mean, that, that thing is a must and you could exchange lenses. But of course, if you don't want to invest in lenses right away, the 14 to 42 is a really good range. Now, if if you already have the GH4 and GH5, you, you can't use the batteries that come with it. You have to get a BLC 12PP battery. Now here we are, this is essentially a GH4 Micro Four Thirds sensor and processor setup. It's like the little brother of the GH4. Both the battery and the card slots on the bottom and they don't get blocked by a plate. The HDMI out is gonna be annoying for people that want to use a monitor all the time because, well, where do you hold on to the thing? with HDMI out. Thankfully, the mic port, which is gonna be most used by bloggers, is out of the way. It's on the left side. The grip is really nice. Uh, you can even hold it selfie style. But honestly, I felt a little bit fatigued after doing that for a while, you know, extending it all the way out. So I recommend getting a little, you know, handle stick. Now let's switch the sucker to video mode, which is what I want to explore the most. Now putting the lens on, it is still very light. This 14 to 42 does not add any weight at all, really. Putting a battery in there, uh, it's still light. So you get the usual picture styles here. It's just missing V-Log but it does have Cinelike D and Cinelike V for those people that want a little bit more detail in the shadows and highlights, you know, uh, filmmakers essentially. In MP4, you do get 4K in 30p and 24p at 100 megabits per second. This might be, you know, eating up a little bit more storage space than people want. So thankfully there are HD 1080p settings, especially in AVC HD 24p, the filmmaker's frame rate of choice is 24 megabits per second. What I'm excited about is that it does have some pro video monitoring tools such as Zebra, which tell you when you are overexposing, which can cause a very unpolished look, especially if the thing that you're filming is overexposed. And you can set it at different settings. Um, looks like my light is overexposed, which is fine because it's a light. Peaking to make sure that you're in focus when you're in manual focus is also really cool to have on a cheap camera like this. It does not have a waveform to tell you how you're exposing, but at least it does have a histogram. Of course, with any camera, we want to know how the footage looks. Looks. And the picture style that you choose within the camera affects this a whole lot. I distilled it down to six of the picture styles. There are quite a few more than that. The standard is actually not that bad looking. Vivid gets a little too punchy. Portrait is a little bit more skin tones. A cine like D for you filmmakers out there gets the most detail in the highlights and shadows. In a more underexposed shot, natural in cine like D retains the details more if you're in a situation that you have to underexpose a lot of elements, like you have a real really, really bright subject. Looking at faces, I film myself in selfie style just to see how my skin looks with a pretty bright sky, pretty bright sun. A standard and natural really stuck out to me as the best looking straight out of the camera. Portrait, a little punchier. Choose whichever one looks best for your skin. Now this test is more for the filmmakers out there. Highlights roll off. You wanna see if there's a weird hard edge in each picture style. And it looks like, ironically, the more pro settings, Cine like V and Cine like D, are the ones that have a weird edge on them. Gonna have to do a little bit of grading in order to smooth those out if that's your look of choice. Now you can 
customize your looks to a certain extent. And the most common one to tweak would be sharpness and contrast to get a little bit more detail in the highlights and shadows. Here's standard and natural defaults on the left and then minus five on the right. And this shows you just to what extent you could reduce that contrast to get a little bit more latitude. Or if you're shooting a scene that just has so much contrast, cine like D, that's the flattest you're gonna get. To reduce your contrast negative five, that's great for being able to grade some. But, but the concern is that this is an eight bit image that's being outputted. What what happens when you crunch things with a curve? Well, actually it, it it's fine. You don't get a lot of degradation or splotchiness. So the camera actually looks pretty good. I have no complaints about that. By the way, my daughter just crashed this stream, so apparently I'm holding her now. So let's go take a look at low light, okay? And you might have some interruptions from her. So YouTube compression is gonna make this a little harder to see full screen, yes, Amara? So I'm gonna just skip through these really quickly so you can see what's the most glaring when compressed, and then we'll take a look at more of uh, the zoomed in images when it comes up later. Now around 1600 ISO is uh, okay, but 3200 ISO, it becomes a little bit too much. Uh, 6400 ISO, it just becomes really nasty. So, but let's zoom in and see what it actually looks like. At 400 ISO, there's actually a little bit of grain. You start to see a little bit more grain at 800 ISO, but it's still acceptable. Now going up to 1600 ISO, it becomes more noticeable, especially zoomed in. That is kind of the upper threshold of acceptability. Daddy? Yes, Amara? Yes, 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 baby. No, you can't have that. Okay, 3200 ISO is when it starts breaking apart. You see that little shaded area in the backdrops? It gets a little posterizy. Uh, and when you get to 6400 ISO, just look at this. Oh my God, what's happening? Dude, that just looks nasty. So this is not a low light camera. I would top it out at 1600 ISO. If you need more than that, I definitely recommend getting a faster lens. Okay, she knows how to play to the camera. Oh no, don't stop my stream, don't stop my stream. See, you're there too, you're there too. Okay, let me see how much I can do. This is a, a highly recommended prime lens, this is f1.7, much faster, very good for low light. So $147, not that much. Yes, you're in picture in picture, Amara. What, what? Oh my goodness. But is this camera sharp in both 4K and HD, which is one of the problems and concerns I usually have with smaller and cheaper cameras like this. Let's check it out. So field of view is a thing that is different between 4K and full HD. So you lose a bit of field of view. It's not so obvious in this shot, but let's take a look at the next shot. You can see here that you definitely see more of the lake in full HD because it does not crop. It does a lot of pixel binning and dithering and whatever and stuff, averaging, so that it doesn't even bother with cropping. It's not super obvious in this shot, so we're gonna zoom in and take a look at what it looks like when you take a closer pixel peek, eh? Here, yeah, it looks a little bit mushier on the right, but it's not horrible. I mean, it's a little bit less than the one quarter resolution at full HD compared to 4K is, but it's not horrible. I mean, how many people are gonna be looking that closely on your YouTube videos or whatever you're posting online? You know, the loss of detail isn't that great. It's totally acceptable in my book. Now to put things into perspective, let's actually take a look at the most horrible 1080p camera that uh, I've recently reviewed, which is the A6100. Oh my God, the loss of detail is insane on A6100. It just becomes mush. Decently better on the G7, actually. Uh, it's, it's definitely soft, but it's not like one eighth resolution that a Sony a6100 looks like. Now looking at 200% zoom between the G7 and GH5S, it's, uh, it's actually not bad. It's definitely softer on the G7, probably because it's previous gen, you know, processor and everything, but the GH5S versus G7, and you know, it's, it's... Now, the bloggers out there are gonna be very interested in this one. You guys gotta create content. Ain't nobody got time to manual focus and manual exposure. So let's take a look at these examples of the autofocus and auto exposure abilities. All right, so first of all, this is not a Sony camera that can lock within a split second. It is contrast detect versus phase detect on the Sony camera. Even if it was locked onto my face here, it was having a little bit of trouble, you know, quickly getting me back in focus. <laughs> 49 area focus, just, yeah, I mean, I, I don't trust that thing. And just look at that, I push in and it still doesn't want to focus on the thing that is most obvious in frame. 
Now where it starts to work is the 49 area autofocus when you're half pressing. You know, half pressing forces it to rethink its life a little bit. You half press it and it goes like, okay, that's that's uh, in focus. So half pressing is your friend in this case with 49 area. What I do recommend is trying tracking autofocus because it works a whole lot more consistently. It'll lock onto an object that you tap on and just keep that object in focus. Now, uh, there are times in which it kind of gets confused and gets searchy as you'll see in a moment here, uh, but it's overall, it performs pretty well. You can see here that's like, oh, where, where, okay, there, there it is. Now looking at face eye with uh, some auto exposure mode going on here, here it's full auto program mode. I'm just seeing uh, both autofocus and exposing for her face seems to work all right. Not a very smart artificial intelligence for figuring out auto exposure, but it's serviceable for, you know, as long as it's not like you only have one take ever. For my personal test with fake blog episodes, I definitely wanted to check out full auto mode and see where it failed and where I had success. So let's take a look at part three of my garage cleanup series. Hi right, guys, I got pandemic hair today, so I'm wearing a baseball cap. So this is episode three of cleaning up my garage studio. So today we are cleaning up some box is starting with these empty ones and these ones with uh, Christmas decorations. So uh, let's get to it. Now, because I have to fit all of these into the recycle bin, I have to start breaking down the boxes. So I'm pretty sure I tweaked my back just now, putting that stuff up there. I'm an old man. So as you can see, this whole box of donations because Goodwill has been closed and I can really drop it off. But otherwise, it's nice and clear. There's actually room. I have not seen the floor here in like a year. So mission accomplished. So that was autofocus, auto white balance, auto exposure, and it did okay. The, at the very end of my conclusion, you saw that I was totally out of focus because it was like, well, do, do I focus on the black background? I, I feel like that's what I need to do. So my face was totally bright and totally out of focus. But when I stepped up into it, it exposed properly, a little bit dark, but the white balance was a little weird. It was like a little yellow. So I decided for my next test to lock it into daylight white balance. And I also noticed that shutter speed got a little too slow for me for my personal taste. So I switched the camera to shutter priority mode so I could keep it at one. 150th of a second. So let's take a look at how this blog entry looks. Hi everybody, welcome to part two of Your Wifey Gives You a Haircut. This time, Wifey actually saw a YouTube video of how to do it, so. You move your head straight, yeah. Look. You're being conservative, which I like. I'm gonna show a front shot. To say overall, this seems to be going better than last time, right? George is now using pro terms like fade. Number six clippers. Don't get too penisy. Good thing that didn't make you laugh. You're doing the pro shaking through the head thing. <laughs> so now I look like a Taiwanese uh, pop star. It's a very, awesome. very helmet head. Wow, look at how pale I am. Are you too scared to get the bangs? <laughs> Good thing you're cute, you know? Otherwise, this haircut could ruin you. Um, thank you? So now I, I look like a little bit like Spock, which is fine because I style my hair. <laughs> With a little bit of water to simulate hair product. Well, that was a success. Um, so, pat on the back uh, for wifey. Ooh, look, I have a hairy back now. Eww. So overall, it looks good, and with the Video Mic Pro on top of it, it sounds good. And a lot of these cheap kits include a mic, so you don't have to invest anything extra if you're first starting out. But autofocus did rear its ugly head, and I had to edit around it. There are times in which, when facial tracking mode, it still got a little confused, especially when it was the back of my head. It went like, I don't see a face. I think I'll just focus on the background. For me, it's not a deal killer for a blogger, but it's really up to you and what's important to you and what kind of stuff you shoot. If you're always looking at the camera, then the face tracking mode is actually pretty solid. You're just selfieing around. But if you're going crazy in very high paced events and actions and such, and you like to move fast and you don't want to wait for autofocus to catch on, just, you know, go manual focus and, and you'll be fine. Just get good at it, whatever. 
whatever, whatever, right? Now, auto exposure also got a little bit hot at times when I set it to you one third, no, two plus two thirds, stop. So you wanna be a little careful about how you get the EV compensation a little higher or lower. So for the startup blogger, this is a great deal. Nothing is a deal killer in terms of getting this as your first camera. For a filmmaker, it's a great B and C cam if you're already using Lumix cameras to shoot your events or your interviews or whatever with. So I highly recommend people that are looking for a great camera that gets good looking footage, that has serviceable autofocus and auto exposure, gets nice sharp image as well in 4K and 1080p, this is great, so thumbs up from me, and I think we're gonna actually keep this. But we're actually gonna be testing out the ZV-1 next, which is a lot more expensive for just the camera by itself. It's not even out yet, it's only available for pre-orders. But you know, it seems like it could possibly blow this camera out of the water if you have the budget for it. To know when that review comes out and for live tapings of the review, please hit like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And I just ran out of... Breath. <sighs> okay, this is my 20 seconds in which you uh, just go ahead and uh, subscribe from here. You could just hover your, your mouse over and then you have things right here. You could click on to my other videos.